Hello everybody, Tyron TG3 here, Pokemon Horizons, episode 31, the title is The Song in the Mist, episode 32, that title is Lapras, Thoughts for its Companions, and episode 33, The Roaring Brack Raquaza. Woo, um, this, I'm basically dubbing this the Lapras Saga, cause that's what it is, or the Lapras Arc, as you will, I say this is the Lapras Arc, um, this goes without saying, but I think this was a really good arc. This this three chained episodes that were going on. I I love the way that the middle goes on. The beginning had me worried. And I'm glad they threw me in for a loop for this one. The beginning made Lapras come off as like this very nice Pokemon that just leads people out of the ocean. And then the show digs into the idea that what if Lapras was straight up gangster? This Lapras is gangster as hell. This whole saga was gangster as hell. First of all, Lapras does lead people out of the fog. But that's because it makes the fog. Yeah, that... So it turns out, Lapras... I'm just going to get straight to the meat of it. Because by, by the time this goes up, you guys have already seen the episodes. Or at least I hope so. And again, this is a review. Lapras makes the fog using the move Mist, and then afterwards it has like a team of Pokemon right on top of a Whale Lord, and then hop on ships, grabbing their stuff, then like gets off the ship. Once they get off the ship, Lapras then leads them out of the very mist that it created. Awesome gangster shit. That is gangster as hell. The Pokemon, these Pokemon are doing Grand Theft Auto on the seas. These are, we got a pirate crew. Like, that is cold. That is cold. That is cold. I like that. Because the sailors are like, yeah, we got saved by Lapras when we were in the fog. Eh, we lost a couple of items, so we got to purchase some new stuff. But it did lead us out. Turns out, no, nah, they've been duping them the whole time. It's got nothing to do with saving them. They didn't save them from nothing. They just made them trapped and then got out. This, this is very intricate. Like, I am legitimately impressed that this team of Pokemon worked in this fashion. And I know what you're thinking. This has happened before in Pokemon, or at least in the older series where Pokemon trick people. Or people will team up with Pokemon to trick other people. But something about this just made it really personal. I think it's because Liko and the others are on a ship. So because they're on a ship, obviously this will affect them a lot more. Affecting cargo, stealing cargo is a big deal when you're on a ship. Because some people are on ships for months. Hell, years in some situations. Losing cargo is a problem. Like if you don't restock, you're screwed. So, Lapras is literally robbing people. And Diana does go, well, these are stray Pokemon that technically don't belong in the ocean. So, from their perspective, they're just trying to eat. Yeah, it's still pretty gangster that they did it, though. It's still pretty messed up. I mean, those sailors, if they don't have the food to survive in the ocean, they die. So, Lapras is doing a good thing for Pokemon, but it's letting people die. It's it's such a nice, like, change of pace for Lapras, too. Because Lapras has always been noted as this Pokemon. And, oh, Lapras are such goody two-shoes, good boy, good girl Pokemon that travel people out to seas. It understands human language. It can drift people from one island to the next to save them from uh, dying out at sea. What if Lapras just said, screw that, screw humans, I'm stealing their stuff and I'm bouncing. Like, that... I don't know, something about that is just very refreshing. So we end up seeing Lapras go steal that stuff. And when Lapras goes to steal, they get team, um, they get the team at first. They get the, um, the Rising Volt Tacklers at first. They steal some food. The second go round, though, when they go, they go to charge toward the Lapras. And Lapras and the team, Lapras is pirates is what they dubbed them. They end up attacking back. And here we see that, um, we see the old man whose name is escaping me for some reason right now. And I don't know. It's probably because we haven't seen his name posted in a while. Uh, I think I mistakenly called him Murdoch in the last episode. Um, but yeah, the old man goes in and he uses his Quacksire. And when he uses Quacksire, um, he ends up 
what was his name again? Sorry about this. Ludlow. It's Ludlow. My bad. I was right. Ludlow. So Ludlow goes in and has Quacksire use Surf. But he's using Surf so that he, uh, the old man can change the ship direction based on the waves. So that they can dodge attacks and counter the other attacks using the the wave. And it's just like this straight up like pirate battle. Shit's cold as hell. I'm like, yo, this is awesome. They're having like a pirate battle against the, the water Pokemon. And like you can see the waves and the water moves. The hydro pumps clashing against each other. You can see that the old man is maneuvering the ship back and forth. I love when Chansey winds up rolling like an egg across the ship. And then like you can see Sprigates, you know, like clawing the floor of the ship and Liko and Roy are like flying backwards and even like Freed is like holding his hat down it's just going this sways back and forth but it's just getting chaotic it's getting chaotic as hell and I love it I love it. Finally, Lapras comes up and is like, yo, I got this. Lapras charges forward, smacks the ship straight in, and like hits them, then blasts them with an ice beam and keeps them in place. Oh my god. I, I never thought I'd be excited to see a ship battle in Pokemon. That, a dog fight in Pokemon is cool. I never, a dog fight's something I never thought I needed until I saw one. Pokemon, I think, has had ship battles before. But they're so far and few between, and they rarely happen. And, and Ash and whatever team he's with is usually on foot, so it doesn't happen that often. But to see this was really cool. I loved it. And again, that's because the Rising Volt Tacklers, in all intents and purposes, are a pirate crew. Kind of. They're, they're a pirate crew. I mean, basically, they're a pirate crew. So to see them be, like, in that. And I love when um, Freed is like, all right, I got a plan. Here. We're going to go ahead and set all the food out for them to steal. Uh, Murdoch and uh, Molly, you go get the food. And then I'm going to go draw the attention with using Captain Pikachu's th like Volt Tackle Tornadoes technique. And then once we do that, we can spot where they're coming from. Liko, Roy, you guys hold watch up on the front. Like, I love to see that all of the ship crew members are, like, doing their job. You can see Dot is, like, tracking the location using the computer. Diana is scouting out and gathering information. Like, you can really see, like, everybody working together. I love this, like, pirate-esque arc that's been happening. This this pirate situation. It's really cool. I was so afraid that Lapras was going to be, like, this really kind Pokemon. And, oh, pirates came and, like, shot it with a net or something. Or poisoned it. Or, oh, this Lapras doesn't trust humans because humans hit it a couple of times with rocks or something. I really was hoping they weren't going to do that again. Because when it comes with Lapras, that Lapras has the same dragged out story every time. Lapras' story is always humans are bad. And Lapras is just trying to blah, blah, blah. We've got to stop the people from blah, 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 blah. And Lapras doesn't trust us because blah, blah, blah. Like, ah, no. I love the take on the Lapras that's just like, Fuck these people. Like, screw them. Screw them. I, I don't care. I don't care about these people. I love that take. That is a cold take on Lapras. I love that. Even when Liko finds the plan, she figures it out. She's like, wait a minute. They keep stealing cargo. They don't need the fruit. Or they don't need the, the box. They just need the fruit inside. So they're probably just ditching the boxes wherever they go. What if we just follow the boxes and then go to where Lapras is gonna be? So at that point, they find the plan to just fly to where Lapras is going to be, using the boxes as a trail. That's a smart plan. So when they do that, they meet up with Lapras. Liko gets the chance to fully talk with it, along with Tarapagos. And then after that, Lapras finally bonds with Arbaliva and Moltres. And then at that point, Lapras is making the decision to travel with Liko, along with uh, Lucius's other Pokemon. So, yeah, we finally get our conclusion to the plot Honestly, I wouldn't have mind another dog fight with Lapras. Shit was kind of cool, but I get it. They had to go ahead and end it. And I definitely feel like the Rising Volt Tacklers are a lot more involved in this plot than last time. Because last time, I believe Molly and Roy and Liko were the only ones that caught our believer or helped catch our believer. Moltres was Freed, Liko, and Roy. This time, we've got everybody working together. Everybody took played a role in this one. Everybody decided to work together on this one. 
Diana even frees the the ship using the flamethrower technique uh, on Arcanine to melt the ice. So that so everybody is actively working together to um, to catch Lapras. And honestly, I like that. I like that as they move further towards each of the ancient Pokemon, they got to get stronger or they got to do act more active activity in order to get better. Once Liko finally gets Lapras, though, we move to the next episode, which, realistically, it's an Amatheo episode. Amatheo decides to go ahead and catch Black, or try to catch Black Rayquaza. And the reason this happens is because now that three of the ancient Pokemon are gathered, I think is drawn to that energy, too. Lu like, four of Lucius's Pokemon are all in one spot, so is getting in on that action. Once that happens, um... Amatheo just charges in, and everybody knows full well. First of all, Black Rayquaza, it's Black Rayquaza. This thing's strong as hell. And Amatheo's like, I'll catch it. And I'm like, you are? You are, though? No, Rayquaza. Rayquaza smacks Amatheo down something fierce, which is expected. Honestly, I'm surprised Cerulege is alive. That thing got hit with three Dragon Pulses, like, almost in face range. It, realistically, it's dead. But it's not, because Pokemon. But it did. It got smacked. I believe both uh, Corviknight and Cerulege got smacked hard. Amatheo got whooped. Got whooped. And then after that, because, like, humans are effing with it, Black Rayquaza decided to go on a rampage again and uses Draco Meteor and just sort of wreaks havoc on everybody. Thankfully, Terrapagos decides to transform into its true form. Which I'm sure somebody's going to say, it's the stellar type or whatever. And it, it transformed into its true form and used its ultimate move, which I can't remember the name right now because I haven't unlocked it in the DLC yet. Which, again, Twitch. You can check me out as I play Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And then maybe we'll be able to see that ultimate move. Who knows? Future me has probably already seen it. Anyway, we see that and they head back to the ship. And they're mostly just licking their wounds after that. Roy is kind of upset because he knows full well he's nowhere near the level to fight it. And uh, Diana's basically talking about leaving. She's like, yo, I've, I've found out a lot of information. I'm, I'm going to bounce. I'm going to go ahead and bounce. Uh, the rest of the information I need, I got to go find it out by myself. Plus, I've never been one for crews, which is sad because Diana's been a pretty good crewmate up to this point. Like, she doesn't overstay her welcome, but at the same time, she's not like so... I was afraid when she joined the crew, they were going to do one of two things. One, she was going to show up too much, or two, she wasn't going to show up enough. Like, oh, they would only use her for plot-related episodes and then put her back in her box. Uh, no, she shows up a decent, a fair amount of times. She shows up when it's, like, appropriate. And then there's times where even if it's not, like, plot-related, she does show up to, like, have character moments with the other. She truly felt like a temporary Rising Bolt Tackler member. And honestly, I like that. And I like the fact that even though she's Liko's grandmother, she doesn't slam the show with her presence. Like, oh, I'm her grandmother, so everything about me has to be super relevant. No, there's moments where she's literally just sipping tea and chilling. There's moments where she's witnessing. There's moments where she's active and she's fighting. And there's also moments where she gathers information like the others. She gives Dots her props for, like, tracking down Lapras. But she also says that she's not good with machinery, so she needs Dot's machinery expertise. Like, I love that she comes in and out. She felt natural. She never felt like she was doing too much or too little. She felt like a natural person in the group, and I really like that. So seeing her go realistically was like, okay, I can feel for this. I feel for this moment. This feels appropriate. And the last thing she decides to do before she is heading out is have a battle with uh, Liko and Roy. Just to strengthen them up. It's training, which is necessary. And I'm going to be real with y'all. don't like the battle. I mean, I, I like it to some degree. I I think this would have been the, the most appropriate time for Sprigatito and Fuecoco to learn some new moves. Because I'm going to be real with y'all. Sorry, wrong button. I'm going to be real with y'all. Their moveset sucks. It's like absolute terrible. Like their moveset is absolute ass. Like pure ass. Sprigatito still knows Scratch for some reason. And, and Fue Coco knows freaking Tackle. 
And Boy Coco's moveset looks so weird. Like, if you look at it, it knows Tackle and Ember Steel for some reason. And then right behind that, it knows Flamethrower and Stomping Tantrum. Yeah! Two destructively powerful ground and fire type moves. And some lame-ass normal and fire type moves around it. Like, what? Nah, get rid of Tackle, bro. Get You gotta get rid of Tackle. At this point, Foy Coco needs to learn Uproar or Sing or, or something. Something. Like, what is this? What is this? I kind of, I, you want to know what would have been cool? I would have loved if, like, Lapras, while it was out and doing that song that it was doing, Foy Coco learned Sing during that point. Like, because it's trying to, because it loves to sing anyway. So now it learns the move sing. How cool would that have been? How appropriate would that have been to, oh, maybe it learns, like, because it's a, like, it likes music, it's picking up on other songs and learning those other songs. That would be its clue of, like, it slowly turning into Skeledurge. And Skeledurge sings anyway, so it's utilizing that. Now, it still knows fucking Ember for some reason. Like, what? Bro, no, like, get rid of that. Like, it's terrible. It doesn't even learn, like, Flame Charge or Heat Crash or anything. It just still knows the same moves. Sprigatito knows Tackle, Sweet Scent, Leafage, and Quick Attack. Like, oh my. They didn't even do a strategy around those other moves. She uses Leafage, Quick Attack, and Scratch in the, in the fight. Doesn't even use Sweet Scent for some reason. Oh, no, it doesn't know Sweet Scent. It knows Leafage, but the Leafage is supposed to smell good. I think Sweet Tip would have been fine. So the condition of the battle was if they can land one hit on Arcanine, then they win the fight. Which I get it. It's because Diana's Arcanine is way powerful than Sprigatito and Fue Coco. So naturally, they got to find a way to make a comeback on that. The issue with that, they never do. Like, they never do. What they end up doing is attacking Arcanine, and Arcanine basically overpowers them in the fight, then uses Sunny Day, and then Sprigatito and Fue Coco power up from Sunny Day. Sprigatito has Overgrow, which is its ability, and Fue Coco's fire attacks get stronger. But the same should be happening to Arcanine. Its flamethrower should be getting stronger because of the Sunny Day too. So realistically, nothing changed. They got stronger, but Arcanine got stronger too. So the gap is still there. Nothing's changed. You want to know what would have been cool? If Sprigatito had learned Synthesis. Yeah, that move. You want to know why? Because guess what? Synthesis gets stronger in the sun. Heal the others up. Make them stronger. Then they could have counterattacked. Stomping Tantrum is a move that does more damage if it fails the first time. So if Fue Coco uses Stomping Tantrum and Arcanine dodges it with extreme speed, then that's a stronger Stomping Tantrum. If Liko picked up on that, she could have went, oh, I have an idea. Let's keep using Stomping Tantrum. That way it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And then when it gets to its strongest and Arcanine's on defense, I can have Sprigatito use speed, healing itself using synthesis and getting stronger from the sun, and then using quick attack to match Arcanine's speed. And as a bonus, I can throw in Sweet Scent to slow Arcanine down. Strategy. But you want to know what they do instead? They have a flamethrower battle, and like when the explosion happens, Sprigatito hides behind the smoke and catches it off guard with Scratch. And yeah, that's a strategy. It just feels lame. It feels, it's just a lame strategy. That's the problem. I'm sorry, but like, I like Liko and Roy as characters. My issue is, I don't think they've really gotten the chance to get stronger. They've done battles, but unfortunately, Sprigatito and Fue Coco are doing the same generic moves against the same opponents or almost the same opponents. And when a battle happens, they resort to using their standard attacks. It's the Pikachu use Thunderbolt, Piplup use Bubble Beam thing all over again from Diamond and Pearl. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, typically when Ash and Dawn wind up in bad situations, they just had Pikachu use Thunderbolt and Piplup use Bubble Beam. That was their default. They would do that all the time. There was no strategy involved. There was no intricate moves. There was no use of other moves. It was just them using the same move over and over and over. 
and it got exhausting. It got real exhausting. So I wish they would take the time to teach. Like Sprigatito still knows leafage. That move is like a that move is like a worse razor leaf. A worse razor leaf. Like bro, teach Sprigatito. I don't know razor leaf seed bomb. Teach it. Seed bomb is basically a prelude to the move that um. Mouscarada learns, which is where it essentially makes a plant that explodes like a grenade. Teach it seed bomb. Has Rigatito launch some seed bombs and then have them detonate at different times. That way, Liko can use like a plan. Like, oh, I launched a, spe a seed bomb inside the leafage. So while you kept getting distracted by getting hit by leafage moves, you didn't see the seed bomb. Seed bomb's in there. Boom! It activates, blows the opponent up. Or launch Seed Bomb and then the opponent dodges it. But Sprigatito uses Quick Attack and hits the opponent. And the opponent keeps dodging each of the moves. Turns out they're backing up. And every the time they're dodging the moves, they're backing up closer and closer. And then now, activate. Boom. Seed Bomb. Blows them up. Like, they're so... Like, it bugs me that Scratch is still in the move set. Like, that... Uh, why? Because it's a cat? Okay, teach it Fury Swipe. Slash. Give it... Fucking slash, please. Sprigatito should still not be using Scratch up to this point. And I know I'm skipping ahead of things here, but episode 34, Amatheo lost to Rayquaza, and he is actively getting stronger. Meanwhile, Sprigatito still knows Scratch. Like, what the shit? What? The it doesn't even know Home Claws to make it stronger. Like, ah, that. God. Damn it! Oh, teach, teach Fue Coco Belly Drum. It's a drum type move, and it makes Fue Coco stronger. Ho, 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 gay turn. Wouldn't that be cool? And then, oh, I got a plan. Roy, use a uh, Belly Drum. Ho, 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 gay turn. And then it costs like damage, right? And then she goes, okay, Sprigatito. Now use Synthesis. And then like the Synthesis can heal. Fue Coco, and then heals Fue Coco up so he doesn't, he's not hurt from his own attack. Then he can use a stronger stomping tantrum. Like, yo, the battles, and you want to know what, like, messes with me the most, and I know this, this review is going on the longest. You want to know what messes with me the most about the battles in Horizons? They started off so strong in the first, like, few episodes. And then you'll have these occasional episodes where the battles are really good. And then, like, if they're not doing an Amatheo-based battle, which those are the, mostly the battles that are good, or Freed's battles, if they're not doing Freed or Amatheo's battles, all of the other battles are just, eh. They're mediocre at best. Until Captain Pikachu comes in to save Roy and Liko. And that was the issue I had way back then, was that Pikachu had to save them a billion times. Like, Captain Pikachu had to basically save them a bunch of times. Whereas here, like, like, it feels like they're still around the same strength that they were when they were in Paldea the first time. It doesn't feel like they got realistically any stronger. And we're on our, like... As of at least the time of this review, we're on our, like, third ancient Pokemon. We're halfway. We're on our third ancient Pokemon. We got Arboliva. We've got Galarian Moltres and Lapras. We still have Entei and Cleavor to go. And Rayquaza, obviously, is the last one. And yet, for some reason, I don't feel like they're any stronger than when they got Arboliva. Realistically, no. They're around the same level, and that's what's bugging me. Which is sad, because I like the plot that's happening in Horizons when done correctly. But the strength of the characters hasn't budged for real at all. Liko caught Hatena. Nice. Hatena was useful briefly. Nice. Hatena's barely made any screen time for real as it is. Terrapagos gains a new form, but that's not Liko getting stronger. That's Terrapagos getting stronger. It, I don't know. I, Liko and Roy feel rather stagnant, and I didn't want to turn this review into a rant. It's just I'm more passionate about this critically because I, I like the direction the show wants to go, but I need the characters to move in that direction too. Otherwise, 
it's gonna, I feel like we're gonna run into a situation, much like in Best Wishes, where the characters weren't strong at all up until like a certain point, and then they gained boost of strengths out of pure nowhere. Um, Journeys did this too. Well, not Journeys, I'm sorry, Sun and Moon did this too. Sun and Moon did this too, where everybody was pretty passive, with the exception of maybe Ash and like, um, I'm forgetting names right now. Kiawe, Ash and Kiawe. Ash, Kiawe, and Gladian were like the only ones really gaining any strength. And then by the time we got to the end of the series, suddenly everybody's Pokemon were evolving and everybody could use Z moves and everybody was so strong and handsome. Like, uh, I, I, I just don't want us to get to a situation where we're on like the fifth ancient Pokemon and then suddenly everybody's evolving and doing all this random shit. And in Best Wishes, Axew and Scraggy were like baby Pokemon that were boxing and then Axew suddenly gained steroids out of nowhere and start learning Dragon Rage and all these other inappropriately strong moves. That's what I'm afraid of the uh, Horizons doing. I'm afraid Horizons isn't doing well with the Pokemon's pacing of strength. And I would say that for everybody, except it's only those two. Later in the next review, you're going to see that a certain character does legitimately get stronger. But I'm moving ahead of myself, and we're going to talk about that actually in episode 34. I'm mean, sorry, 33. This episode is 33, The Roaring Black Rayquaza. So, with that said, I will see you all. Then everybody... Oh, what am I doing? I am tripping. I am tripping. Sorry. Episode 34 is uh, Respective Departures. God, what, what is wrong with me today? But episode 34 is Respective Departures. I'll see you all. Then everybody, Tyrone TG3, out.